Hello, everybody. Has anybody told you that they love you today? I love to hear that. Well, me and God certainly do. I want you to know that coming in here. They are passing out some Bibles right now, so if you need one, just raise a hand. They would love to give you one. Over the holidays, I had a chance to spend an entire week with my whole family, which included my awesome nephew, Bo. He is the greatest little kid in the world. He started using words. We got the chance to just spend a whole week loving on him as a family. And at the end of our week with him, my sister-in-law was holding him, and she started pointing out each member of our family. And she would ask Bo, what does Papa say? And Bo would answer back, I love you. It was the cutest thing in the world. And she kept going around. She says, what does Gigi say? What does Uncle Nate say? And Bo would keep saying, I love you. And in that cuteness, I thought, how incredible is it that the one thing he knows about each of us is that we love him? And it reminded me why I ask that question every time I get on this stage. Because the one thing I desperately want each of you to know is that God loves you. Today, we're going to get to talk about that love some more. Like Jeff said, we're launching a new series It's one we have been building up to for about three months. Today is going to be our first Sunday walking through the book of Hebrews together. We did it. We are here. It's awesome. And Hebrews is going to be a book that is going to make you fall in love with Jesus. It emphasizes how awesome Jesus is, how much work God's Son has done for us, and how we should live in light of that. It's a book that simply screams over and over again. Jesus is better. Jesus is greater. He is supreme. And to start our discussion going through this book, though, I want to remind us of what we've learned over the past couple of months. So would you open up with me to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. This is the verse we have been using over the past few months to start almost every single sermon as we've gone through our At Many Times and In Many Ways series. And now we're going to be able to look at Hebrews through the lens of this verse, start our discussion there. The Hebrews 1.1 says this, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. And really the beauty of this verse and this whole section, it hangs on those two words. God spoke. God has revealed himself to us. He has not left us as lost sheep trying to figure out who he is or what story we've been placed into. At the beginning of our last series, we talked about the many different unique ways in which God spoke to us. How he appeared in in dreams and in visions. How he appeared in fire or talked through a donkey or came in a whisper. How he used life experiences, words from friends. How he inspired the poems, the songs, the stories that have been collected together in the Bible. And after we talked about the many different ways in which God has spoke, we talked about what God said, the content of those messages. We took quite the survey through the Old Testament to look at all these different messages God spoke, and I want to take just a minute to remind us of those messages, because they're going to help us to fully appreciate Jesus in the book of Hebrews. We started off by talking about the prophet Moses, and God speaking through him how he's rescued us and spoken to us, and so we have to worship and obey him. We move forward to Samuel. And saw how God is our one true king. Then Elijah taught us how God comforts us in our spiritual distress and empowers us to fight idolatry. Elisha, his successor, continued that by showing us that God is the one true God who showed up for Israel in her times of trouble. And then we move forward to the prophets who wrote prophetic books that are full of God's messages. Isaiah proved that God has a plan for the present, for the future, and for the rest of eternity. Ezekiel painted a picture for us of God's glory. God's glory being revealed to the people of Israel. It being removed in their rebellion and how God had a plan to restore it. And then we took a weekend as we struggled through another cancer scare with Pastor John. 
And we looked at the book of Habakkuk. Teach us how to respond to evil with lament and with joy. Hosea and Amos taught us how God both rebukes and judges faithless people and yet still gives them the hope of salvation. And Jonah furthered that message by showing us God's radical mercy that we are called to give even to our enemies. And then we wrapped up that series by taking a look at the different messianic prophecies throughout the Old Testament that point to the hope of Jesus. You see, over the past few months, as we have taken a look at just this one verse, we have seen so many of God's characteristics. We have seen his holiness, his mercy, his justice, his righteousness, his love. These are all things that Jesus is going to clearly show us in Hebrews as well. And on top of that, over these past few months, we saw an overview of the full story of God of God creating and rescuing Israel, and then Israel, God's people, rebelling against him. God sending all of these prophets to come in and correct them, but them continuing to fall into idolatry. And eventually, God exiling his people and allowing their nation to be destroyed. Yet, through every one of the chapters in the story, There was this promise of a future redemption, a redemption that comes in Jesus. You see, every sentence spoken by those prophets was a sentence pointing to Jesus, which is what finally brings us to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Let's start back reading at the top of verse 1, Hebrews 1, 1 to 2. Long ago... At many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Let's stop there. This this is it. This is what we have spent three months building up to as a church. That God has fully, supremely, and finally spoken by his son, Jesus Christ. This is the big idea of Hebrews. It's the big idea we have today as well. That God has fully, supremely, and finally spoken by his son, Jesus Christ. The rest of verses 1 to 4, really the rest of the entire book of Hebrews is about exploring why that is such a big deal. Who Jesus is, what he has done, and why it is better than what came before. You see, this verse actually sets the structure for much of the rest of Hebrews. Over and over again, the author is going to bring up something from the Old Testament. And then he's going to show us how and why God speaking through Jesus is better. And not only is it better, it is final. Because nothing is going to eclipse God speaking through his own son. This verse starts by defining this final period. It says, in these last days. And that might sound a little confusing, given that this was written about 2,000 years ago. The author's not trying to claim, though, that the world's about to end tomorrow or anything like that. Oh, this is kind of a ancient and Christian way of viewing all of time, that there are two ages, a a past age long ago and a final age, which has now begun. And the work of Jesus in coming to the earth and dying and rising again closed that past age and started this final age. It almost has kind of this Lord of the Rings, Star Wars fantasy feel to it, right? But ultimately what is being said is this. In this final age, in these last days, which have now begun, they could last for millennia. God has spoken to us by his son. You see, we are still in these last days. And we can still look to Jesus to see how God has spoken to us. There's a connection between God speaking by the prophets and by his son, too. Those past words, they still matter. It's not like we're supposed to get rid of the Old Testament. The author uses the Old Testament to validate what he says about Jesus. He's not trying to tell us to throw it away. 
Instead, he is showing us the calculated, purposeful plan of how God works in history. The Old Testament itself tells us over and over, something better. A Messiah is coming. And everything that the prophet said prepared the way for this. Jesus comes as the culmination of all of their words, as the fulfillment of all of their prophecies, as the final message. And Jesus' greater message, it can really only be fully appreciated in light of everything that the prophets said because he is stepping in to the story they gave us as God's full, supreme, and final word. But I know sometimes many of us struggle with the continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. That sometimes the Old Testament can feel backwards or violent. Maybe that's something you've struggled with, or maybe you've had a friend come up and ask you about that or, or even attack you about that. I remember when I was starting college, really wrestling with this as I started taking some religious classes and I had friends asking me different questions about it. Yet I think something we've seen over the past few months and something we will see as we continue to study Hebrews is that the Bible is one grand unified story. And in God's story, those chapters at the beginning, the Old Testament, they help build up to the chapters at the end and help us to understand those chapters. They show us the depravity of sin, our total inability to overcome sin on our own and why we need Jesus. And so I would encourage you as we go through Hebrews and parts of the Old Testament continue to come up, look for those places of continuity and connection and how the story is building on itself and always pointing to Jesus. See, verse 2 clearly lays out that God has spoken by his son, Jesus Christ. But it's the rest of verses 2 to 4 that tell us why that is such a big deal. How Jesus is God's full, supreme, and final word by taking a look at who Jesus is and what he has done. So let's look at the rest of verses 2 to 4 right now. We'll start at the top of verse 2. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. This is one of those times... Or I feel like we could just read this over and over again until our time ran out. Like if we could really get this. If our lives could be wrecked by these truths. Then it would change everything. If we really believe this about Jesus about who he is and, and what he's done to be God's supreme word to us. We wouldn't struggle so much with making God a priority in our lives. We wouldn't struggle so much with that eye-centered selfishness that somehow puts ourselves on the throne and takes Jesus off of it. We wouldn't struggle with choosing God's perfect path over our own path because we would know Jesus is our king, our creator, our sustainer. He's the final word, and we are simply the creation. And so for the rest of our time, I want us to recognize Jesus on that pedestal, on that throne he belongs. I want us to help our hearts really believe this is who God's son is. We're going to do that by talking about these verses. Hebrew starts by saying that Jesus is the heir of all things. It's a picture of him sharing God's throne. 
that all of creation, everything God rules over, has been given to Jesus. That Jesus has received all that God has promised. He, he's not secondary. He is equal to God. It's a picture of a father sharing his full power and authority with his son. And then the author moves on to tell us something that Jesus has done that we don't normally associate with Jesus. We normally think of Jesus as stepping into the story of the Bible when he came to the earth. But here we learn Jesus has been a part of the story since before all of time. He is the one through whom God created the world. This tells us so many things. That Jesus is eternally existent. That he is all powerful and that he is worthy of all praise. And it is a reminder that the very same one who created all of humanity is the same one who was born, lived, ate, slept, laughed, cried, suffered, and died among humans. And that very same Jesus, it says in verse 3, is the one who upholds the universe by his power. He sustains all things, ruling over them. He's not a watchmaker who made the watch and simply left it to run on its own. No, he created the world, but he is still actively involved in the center of the universe running things. You see, he is not dependent on us. We are dependent on him. And not only do we owe salvation to Jesus, we owe our entire existence to him. Verse 3 continues with a couple more phrases that declare who Jesus is. We already know that he is God's son, but now the author wants to clarify what that means. And so he starts by saying he is the radiance of the glory of God. It's a picture of light bursting out of a source like the sun. Your Bible might use a different word, reflection, that he is the perfect image of God's glory. That everything God is, is seen in Jesus. And he moves on even further to say that Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature. Picture with me a stamp and the imprint it leaves as you press it down. You see, Jesus Christ shares or bears the very same stamp as God's nature. These little phrases here are meant to exalt Jesus, to give him proper authority, to help us to figure out who he is, that he is not secondary, but he is a part of God's being himself. And this is part of a belief the Christians call the Trinity. The Trinity is our belief that God is three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. But he is of one nature and one being who is equal in authority. And Hebrews clearly lays this out. That the Son and the Father are clearly different persons, but they share the exact same nature and they are equal in authority. And the earliest Christians actually fought to make sure that we knew these truths. They didn't want them to get watered down. They didn't want us all of a sudden to start to believe that Jesus and God the Father were the same person, or that Jesus was somehow less than God. And so early on, they wrote creeds and belief statements to make sure this was clarified. And one of them, called the Nicene Creed, says this about Jesus. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. 
almost all of that language is seen right here in Hebrews. And it's what makes the next sentence so incredible. Because the next sentence moves from who Jesus is to what he has done as the climax of the story. That not only is he creator and sustainer of perfect image and of one nature with God, he is the one who made purification for our sins. You see, God created all of humanity to dwell with him in perfect harmony. But as we saw over and over again throughout the Old Testament, humanity rebelled. The whole world, continuing to today, rebels against God's rule. We deliberately choose to disobey God's perfect path for our life. And all of that rebellion, whether it's our greed, our anger, our lust, whatever vice or vices it might be, is called sin. And it is what separates us from God. And throughout the Old Testament, sin is pictured as defiling a person, making one unclean or impure. It created this barrier that stopped them from approaching a pure and holy God. And the only way to deal with this uncleanness in the Old Testament was through the sacrifice of innocence, innocent animals. That could only ever last for a time. It was always a sign that pointed to a need for something better and something greater. Jesus comes on the scene as that something better and that something greater who fully and finally deals with our sin problem through his innocent sacrifice on the cross. You see, this is the story and the message of how your sins can be forgiven. That because of Jesus, there is no longer any need for sacrifice, but the doors have flung wide open. You can come directly to God to repent of your sins, to surrender your life to him, and to worship him every single day. And what a beautiful message it is. And if there is any lingering question in your mind, are we sure Jesus' sacrifice got the job done? Hebrews leaves no doubt. The verbs used there in that verse, they are in the past tense, signifying that this one action forever removed the stain of sin from us. Not only that, but the author makes clear that after Jesus purified our sins, he sat down. You don't sit down when there's still work to do. You sit down when the job is complete. See, it is finished. Our sins can be cleansed. And you notice where Jesus is sitting, at the right hand of of majesty, the place of power and authority throughout ancient times. See, Jesus, the Son of God, who is of the same nature as the Father, is our Creator, Savior, and King. He is God's full, supreme, and final word to us, who has made purification for our sins. He is worthy of all of our affection. Verse 4 simply drives all of that home. That's where we're going to pick up next week as well. That just like the prophets, the angels were known as being messengers from God who spoke with God's authority. Uh, The angels were the very ones who shared the message about Jesus' birth to the people, to Mary and to the shepherds. But Hebrews wants to make sure that we know Jesus is not just another one of these heavenly beings. That Jesus is not just another angel coming to bring more good news. He's not just another prophet coming to continue God's message. But he is the Son of God, the only one who can speak fully, supremely, and finally on behalf of God. And so the question is, do we live 
like these verses are true. Do we live like these verses are true? Where Jesus is not just another nice teacher. He didn't just come to give us the get out of hell free card. He's not someone that we can make into our own image and our own likeness. Do we live like God has spoken in Jesus? When you're looking for guidance or for help or to deal with the consequences of sin, run to God's word and look for the one who perfectly reflects God's character. Do we live like Jesus is the creator and the sustainer of all things? When life puts you in the valley, when your strength runs out, and when you can't find peace, run to the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power. Do we live like Jesus is in God's nature? When you face temptation, when peer pressure or culture confuses you, when Satan's lies come knocking, run to the one who is in the radiance of God's glory and the exact imprint of his nature. Do we live like Jesus has cleansed us of our sins? When we rebel and when our mistakes hurt other people, And when we feel the sting of guilt and shame over and over again, run to the one who sits at the right hand of majesty, knowing the job is done. Let's run to Jesus, church. Amen. He is all these things and so much more. The call of Hebrews is a call to remember that Jesus is the better way. He is God's full, supreme, and final word. And the beauty of learning this message is that Scripture gives us so many reminders of it. There are four passages that speak beautifully of Jesus like this one does. One of them is Hebrews 1, 1 1-4. The other ones, they're all up on the screen, are John 1, 1 1-18. Philippians 2, 5 to 11, and Colossians 1, 15 to 20. My encouragement to all of us this week is to spend time in these passages. Read one of them each day of the week. Before you go to work, before you start your day, remind yourself who Jesus is. Write them down on note cards. Put them in your bathroom mirror or on your car. Memorize one of them. Come back to it throughout the day. Fall in love with these. Cling to these passages like precious jewels. Don't let the beauty and the greatness of Jesus escape us for one day. Every single day, let's make it a priority to remember that Jesus is better, he is greater, and he is supreme. Amen. We're going to get to do a lot of that through the book of Hebrews. And I'm real excited as we continue. Now I'm going to wrap us up. I'm going to invite the worship band up. I'm going to close us in a word of prayer. My encouragement to all of you this week, though, is let's remember and live like these verses are true. Like Jesus really is better, greater, and supreme. And as we go to this time of worship, I'd love to ask you, let's lift the name of Jesus high. Let's lift the name of my King high. Can we do that? Let's not just sing empty words. But let's sing words that are full of the beauty and the wonder at who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Let me pray to close us. Dear Heavenly Father, we are in awe that you would give us beautiful passage like this in your word so that we could fully understand who Jesus is, what he has done for us, why it is so much better than what came before. God, we are thankful for the Old Testament and all the lessons we have learned through it, the lessons we will continue to learn, God, of our desperate need for you, of your deep care and love for us. And God, we are so grateful that 
the end of the Old Testament wasn't the end of the story. That Jesus was coming and he has come. He has purified our sins. We are thankful for your love today. We pray as we go out this week, would you not allow our hearts to forget these things? Would you put them deep within our hearts, Lord, in the moments where we need them most, God? And in the mundane moments where we don't think we need these truths at all, would you remind us of who Jesus is? Oh, we love you so much. We pray you help us to love you more. Amen.